guest lecture uh, from Mr. Geoff Skinsley, who is the Executive Vice President for Human Resources L'Oreal. And uh, let me say, this is one of the closest corporate friends for the Graduate School of Management, St. Petersburg University. We have, uh, I think, about 10 years of uh, collaboration with uh, the L'Oreal. And uh, I can say for sure, this is one of the best known and uh, beloved companies uh, among uh, our students. And the reason is very simply, we enjoy the fact that L'Oreal has a number of global business games uh, in business uh, enterprise in general, in branding, in HR, but equally true, we are very happy with this fact because our students are the most frequent winners uh, in these business games. Uh, and uh, listen carefully, not only in the Russian Federation, but globally as well. And when we had uh, a small talk before this meeting, uh, uh, Jeff recollected when he was on the jury, one of the global finals, when for the first time, in the history of Russian Federation, our students won the top prize uh, in the global final. But certainly our relationship with L'Oreal goes far, far beyond just business games. We have uh, one of the most successful recruitment experiences with L'Oreal. And uh, very important is the fact that it's not only just about 20 graduates from the school already hired by L'Oreal, but quite a number of them were directly hired or transferred to the Paris office in quite important positions from our bachelor and master programs. We certainly enjoy very, very frequent guest lectures and internships and career days activities and this list is very long of what we are doing together, hopefully mutually beneficial style. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you. That's it? Okay. Um, well, I'm equally delighted to be here. Um, I'd just like to say it's the second time I personally have come to St. Petersburg and to your wonderful school, but the last time I came, it was still being restored. I came and did a talk in a smaller room to a smaller number of students while all the wonderful renovation work was, was going on around me. And I come back five years later and I see these truly magnificent halls and this wonderful establishment that you built, which not only has a fantastic historical resonance, but of course a very, very strong academic reputation. So we are very proud and happy to be long-term partners with the Graduate School of Management in St. Petersburg. And this is one more um, brick in the wall of a very strong edifice of that partnership, which has already run for 10 years and we hope will run for many more years. So I have a, a small amount of time with you uh, when I would like to introduce you to a company an industry, and also talk a little bit about developing leaders. Now, I'm in the uh, premises of a very august management school, and I would not dream to talk to you about strategies for developing leaders, but we have at least a philosophy, which I will try and briefly explain to you. But before I do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the company, um, and really why we have been able to be as successful as I think we have. But the first and one of the most important things about our company is that we are single industry. We are very large, we're a Fortune 200 company, but we've built our reputation and our success through a single industry, which is the beauty industry. And we do it because we believe that every single man and woman on the planet aspires to look their best, feel their best, and as a result, we have a mission that's a very universal mission. It's to offer women and men across the world the best quality, most effective, safest cosmetics, and thereby satisfy all their beauty needs and desires in all their infinite diversity. So there are as many different beauty needs as there are people on the planet, and we have to find the right way 
of, of accommodating all of them and through every single channel. And this beauty market is a market that is often underestimated because people think, well, it's, it's beauty products, you know, they don't really matter that much. But actually, um, there's several ways of illustrating that this market is a very fundamental and important little pillar in society. Firstly, from a purely business context, if you look at how the market grows over 20 years, there are some markets that are very cyclical. They have their ups and then they have their downs. The beauty market, and here you see the figures over about 15 years, has never not grown. Whatever the economic state of a region or even of the world economy, there is always growth inside the beauty market because it's a fundamental need. Men and women around the world want to look their best. They're not high ticket items in the beauty market, but they are part of the everyday purchases and desires of men and women around the world. So it's a very resilient market that grows steadfastly year after year, and that's one of the reasons why I believe it's such a, a, a market with future potential. So one way of looking at it is purely from the numbers, that it grows all the time. We are a leader in that market, and as a result of 100 years of activity in it, you can see that we have been able to become quite a big corporation just by focusing on that single industry. Um, so, as you can see from the date 1909, a little over 100 years ago, we started, um, it was a chemist who started out with a technological breakthrough, the first inoffensive modern hair dye for colouring your hair for women. Um, we've built over time 23 brands that have global reach. We're present in 130 countries. Um, you can see the sales figure in euros, that's worth about $28 billion last year probably about $30 billion this year. Um, and rapid sales growth, you can see that number of 11% for 2010 was two and a half times the rate of the market growth. So we're managing to grow faster than the market. Um, we are the number one cosmetics company, but it's not just number one in terms of numbers, it's also in terms of how we aspire to understand that beauty market. Um, because we need to, if we want to be number one, it's not just simply in terms of sales, it has to be in terms of knowledge, and it has to be in terms of the leadership that we provide for that industry. And one way of demonstrating that is by R&D. So you can see a couple of figures from R&D, uh, nearly 600 patents every year. People assume that patents are something that come from aeronautics or the defense industry. Um, well, they do, but they also come from the cosmetics industry. And in France, L'Oreal is one of the top five holders of patents, all industries considered. Um, and it's one way of demonstrating that this is an industry in which technology, innovation, R&D can play as big a role as if you're in the car industry or any other uh, more engineering or science-based uh, category. Um, so we have about 66 uh, or so thousand employees and we manufacture more than 5 billion units uh, a year, including through a plant in Russia. Uh, and I would say out of our 66,000 employees, we have over 1,000 in Russia. So you're an important part of our story. Now, uh, we are the number one in the world, and in a very simple series of about 10 slides, I'd like to share with you why we believe we've been able to get to and sustain that number one position. We really think we've got six strategic pillars that get us there. Um, and the first one is, quite simply, belief in our industry, belief in the beauty business. Um, the beauty business is not something that was invented 50 or 100 years ago. Um, we have pioneered research done by scholars outside our company, which have demonstrated that all of the very earliest civilizations, wherever they were on the planet, one of the earliest gestures that those civilizations um, basically moved to was about adornment, about appearing as as good as you can, as well as you can, about expressing your personality through how you adorn your body, your hair, your face, and how you look after your skin. So we know from the research that was done, as I say, by scholars completely outside our company, that the desire for beauty is something that has been felt since the very earliest civilizations, and then has been built through the ages. And obviously it has different expression depending on the civilization you're in, depending on the era and fashions, but there's always been that basic desire um, and therefore, one of our pillars is to believe very firmly that we are addressing a fundamental need that men and women in all societies around the world have, and therefore we have an important role to play, and our products, hopefully, 
can help improve, little by little, the daily lives of millions and millions of people around the world. Um, and it's also encouraged us to have a very universal vision of beauty, not a single vision with either a single brand or even a single emblematic figure, but a galaxy of brands and a galaxy of expressions of what beauty looks like, depending on who you are and how you want to appear to the world around you. So, as you'll gather, the second very important part is the science, the R&D investment. Um, I mentioned it earlier, uh, but uh, we were founded by a chemist. Uh, we still have a huge, important R&D function where we develop our own molecules. Uh, we participate with many universities uh, in medicine uh, or pharmacology to try and understand better how the skin works, how the hair works, uh, all the transfers that happen within our body. Um, we have more than 3,000 um, full-time scientists employed by the company in three major centers around the world. Uh, and we certainly believe that, that superiority and R&D uh, innovation is at the heart of being a successful company. So people that assume that the beauty industry is a slightly frivolous one, at least in our case, they're mistaken because we have a very long-standing and serious commitment to research that delivers improved products high performance products, high quality products that again seek to improve in a little way the lives of, of men and women around the world. So that's, that's if you like, the, the upstream part. Then obviously we have to be downstream. We have to talk about where do we encounter the consumer. And our strategy there is basically to say that wherever the consumer looks for a beauty product or service, we have to have an offer. Now that can be through professionals such as hairdressers uh, where they are giving advice and they are providing a service so we have a division dedicated to the professional channel where the way the woman or the man receives the, the beauty product is actually through a service and not simply through purchasing a product. More well known probably um, is on the mainstream self-service consumer side. These are brands that you'll be familiar with, L'Oreal, Garnier, Maybelline, which you purchase in drugstores, in supermarkets, in chemists, uh, the length and breadth of the world and that's about self-select, but it's still based on very high quality products and very firm links with our distribution partners. A third area is in um, the more aspirational luxury product era where we have a galaxy of brands uh, that clearly have not only the product quality, but the aspirational brand territory, and those can only be retailed through exclusive selective retail points, and so we have a dedicated division that's designed to making a consumer offer through that beauty channel. The fourth one uh, is more on the, well, you might call it the quasi-medical side, where the pharmacy, the doctor, the prescription of uh, a dermatologist is something that is an important stimulus or source of advice in purchasing a beauty product. And so again, we organize as a business strategy to have one division that's dedicated to selling products exclusively through that channel of pharmacy and through dermatological recommendation. And then finally, something that's often less well known, we have our own retail division with The Body Shop. The Body Shop is a brand we bought about five years ago, uh, which as you probably know, has a very firm and distinctive positioning in the market. Um, it's aggressively about values and about campaigns, but again, it seeks to offer a beauty experience to men and women, um, and that's something that we have preserved inside our organization. So you can see that there are five different business channels through which the brands uh, are offered, and therefore the next logical thing to look at are the brands, because again, if you're not familiar with the company, everybody knows the L'Oreal brand, but we actually have more than two dozen international brands uh, within the division. Um, these are the ones that are in the, the professional uh, division, so L'Oreal, Kerastars, Redken, and Matrix. Matrix has been particularly successful in Russia. Uh, within the consumer products, we have the L'Oreal and Garnier and Maybelline brands, but what is less well known is that we have an African-American brand called Softsheen Carson, which is also very important at offering products for black hair and black skin. Uh, the luxury brands are reasonably well known, including some that we've more recently acquired, like Yves Saint Laurent. But the other thing that's interesting about the brand portfolio is that even if we're a French company by origin, our brands have a very international appeal. So you have Italian brands like Giorgio Armani, American brands like Ralph Lauren, Japanese brands like Shuimura, uh, and so on. So it's a very international portfolio of brands. 
And obviously the point is that they offer a very distinctive and unique platform, which means they're making a complementary appeal to different consumers and with a different aspiration around those products. Then the brands in the pharmacy sector, Vichy, La Roche-Posay, Ineov, which is oral cosmetics, uh, and SkinCeuticals, which are um, high dosage pharmaceutical products that you can get through spas or again through dermatological recommendation. So you can see it's a very wide choice of brands. Now, having those brands is one thing, what you do with them is another, and our fifth pillar for our strategy is very much to make sure we are a global company with a global presence of all those brands. So it's global or nothing. We're not really interested in offering one product in one market. If it's going to be relevant and if it's going to make sense around the world, we need to make sure that all those brands that were on the previous slide are available uh, in the markets north, south, east and west all around the globe. Um, and I would say not only is that very good for consumers because consumers get the full range of the products and services that we offer, but I have to say it's very good for employees as well because it means that the career opportunities around the world are endless because if you have a global appeal for all your brands, then, and we'll come on to talk about this later, it also means from the prospect of working inside a company, you have a chance of working in many different markets because we have a very global approach, not only to our brands, but also to our career management. Um, and that kind of ambition and that kind of scale means that we are very ambitious for the future and we've given ourselves a corporate target collectively of reaching one billion additional consumers in the next 10 years. Uh, we estimate that we probably reach about one billion consumers today, but with the uh, rise of very strong uh, economic powers outside the traditional markets of Western Europe and the USA, with the uh, population where more and more um, of the population are reaching adulthood, because as I'm sure you know from your demographic, demographic studies, the fastest growing parts of the world also have the youngest population. And as all these people reach uh, adulthood, they become more interested in our products. We know from the economic studies we've done that once you reach a threshold of about $1,000 a year of income, you start to become interested and able to afford your first cosmetics product. And the number of men and women who each year are reaching and going through that $1,000 a year threshold is really very important. And those are all potential new consumers for our company. Um, so it means that we can be very optimistic about the growth prospects of our industry and of the company in the decades to come. And one way of illustrating that is simply to show the share of sales that those new growing markets are taking in our business. If you go back 20 years, they were a very modest 8% of our total sales. They doubled in the 10 years to 2000 to be 19%. They doubled again by 2010 to be 36%. And it's our guess that they will be anything between 50 and 60% of our sales um, worldwide in the coming 10 years. So huge growth opportunities because, as I say, there are tens of millions of men and women each year that come into the economic threshold that means they are in the market and they have a desire for cosmetic products. And another way of illustrating that is when you look at the per capita consumption in these different markets. These are figures from last year which show that in Western Europe or in North America there's a remarkably homogenous average figure of spending per year per capita which is around 91 euros. Currently, in the markets outside Western Europe and, the, and North America, it's only about 11 euros a year. So over time, as societies become more affluent, then the amount of spending on cosmetic products will steadily rise. Even within that 10.7, there are already strong variations between countries that have already topped 20 and other countries which are still only at around about one or two euros per capita per year. So again, it's another way of looking at the, the sheer perspective for growth that there are on all these markets uh, for the coming decade. Now, just one sort of page on business strategy. Um, it, obviously, we've got the, 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 that different range between the well-established markets and the new markets, so we have to adapt our business strategy to take account of each of those uh, different prospects. Now, it's a slightly complicated slide, but it's designed to illustrate that there are very different business challenges depending on where you sit on that occasion, and it also illustrates that the one billion consumers that they were after uh, is something that all the countries in the world for L'Oreal can contribute to. If you take the most mature in terms of 
um, spending markets, such as the US and Western Europe. We already have a 20% market share, but 20% is not a huge share of a market. There's still 80% left to grab. And we know, for example, in a country like Germany, that one in two women don't buy a single product from the L'Oreal portfolio at all. So um, it's even in the mature markets where we exist, we know that we can go and search out new consumers with new products and new services. And obviously, as you move along the scale, we have the BRIMP countries, of which Russia is one, where we are already at around about a 10% market share and growing strongly. And there it's really about increasing our presence, increasing our visibility and availability across those markets. But as you move to the newer markets, uh, which we call the next wave, um, you can see our market share is smaller, so therefore we have to make sure more brands, more products are present. And there are some markets where we've really scarcely begun. Uh, so in terms of, of, of the business adventure we have in front of us, um, you can really find a stimulating business strategy to fulfill in any one of those four different uh, geographic regions, because all of them offer a potential for growth. Um, and as I said, in some of those markets, we've really only just started. Now, there's one other aspect of the company um, which I'd like to mention, which is important uh, because I think it's a, it's a non-negotiable in, in business these days, which is that we have a very responsible and sustainable approach to how we run our business. Um, now, that's about the way we plan our innovation. It's about the way our research is run. It's also about the way we do our production, uh, the way we plan consumption. And uh, back in 2003, before it was uh, quite so fashionable, we set targets for our own control uh, of sustainable development. And since 2003, we have reduced by a factor of about 20% our CO2 emissions, our water consumption in production, our energy consumption, and our waste uh, uh, targets. All of those have been reduced per unit produced by more than 20% since 2003. And we have publicly declared that we will reduce them by 50% uh, by the end of the decade. So we very much believe that as part of our role of, uh, in, in society, we have to make sure that the business that we are conducting is done in a responsible way that is alert to the environmental questions that are out there, alert to the role that the community plays, so we have a very active involvement in our communities, uh, and equally in terms of ethical standards, we have a, an ethics officer who reports directly into the CEO, uh, and so we treat all the range of what you might call corporate social responsibility very seriously, whether it's in research, whether it's in production, or whether it's in how we market our products, or whether it's in the conduct and behavior of our business. So that's a very important part of our, of our business proposition. And the final one, which we like to think of as our secret weapon, are the talents inside the company and the culture of our company. Because we are a very special culture, I don't know if anybody in the room has already done an internship or been exposed to our company, uh, but, but we do like to believe we have a very special culture, which in part is linked to the fact that our industry, the beauty industry, is really quite different. Beauty products are about performance, but they're also about emotions, they're about aesthetics, they're about fashion, um, and so it's a tremendous melt melting pot in our market where you have to bring all sorts of different skills to bear, and that creates a uniquely energizing environment, we believe, um, because we have people that are passionate about that single industry and about the products and brands within that industry. And it creates a culture where we encourage everybody to have their own adventure inside the corporation. Our, our, our HR philosophy is really about trying to make sure every individual feels that they are developing their selves, themselves inside the corporation. So in a nutshell, this slide sums up, I think, what we're about. We concentrate on a single business, which is the beauty business. We have a passion for research and creativity. We have a cult of excellence and quality, because otherwise our brands wouldn't have the reputation they have today. We have a strong corporate culture with a very strong focus on people and an exceptional commitment to our employees. Now that begged the question for how do we develop leaders? And I believe we do have a reputation for developing leaders within our organization, both inside the company and also outside the company. And we've been given awards for our development of leaders. Now again, I would not seek in a, inside a very, uh, very high caliber business school to try and uh, preach as to how uh, one should develop leaders. But I know we have a certain philosophy which I'm going to try and summarize 
on three slides, and that has proved itself over the last 20 years at developing leaders. The first one is quite simply recognize them early. We believe that leaders have something inside themselves that simply needs to emerge, needs to be, uh, if you like, helped to come out. Um, so when we are doing our student uh, interviews, we're looking for people that demonstrate future potential for leadership. We're not simply looking for somebody who at 22 has achieved a certain amount of, uh, of uh, say, academic excellence. That's very important. But beyond academic excellence, we're looking for people that demonstrate future leadership potential. And we put a lot of effort into trying to identify what those characteristics are that allow you to set up leadership potential. The second part of it is making sure that when people do join us, very quickly they get their first chance of a management position when they can start to demonstrate what leadership they have inside them. We try and make sure that people within three or four years, whether they're in finance, whether they're in logistics, whether they're in marketing, whether they're in commerce, all of them have access to a first management responsibility that gives them a first taste of organizing other people, demonstrating vision for a part of the business, and therefore developing their leadership. And our training is not only skills training. Often students say, we need training, we need training. The training that we offer is meant to be complementary from what you would get from a business school, because the business school will give you tremendous academic structure uh, about business, and we therefore want to focus a lot more on the personal development side and allowing your own personality to emerge and allowing you to gain confidence in yourself as a young manager. Um, and finally, our philosophy is about each individual realizing his or her own potential in his or her own way, through their own personality. We do not have a standard um, clone, if you like, for what a, a L'Oreal person looks like. Um, and we want people's, managers to, people's management style to evolve in the way that's most comfortable with their own personality. So the first part of the philosophy is try and spot leadership early. The second one is to create the conditions then for that leadership to emerge. Um, and again, that is not imposing a model, it's trying to create um, a permissive environment in which different things can emerge at different pace and in a different way. So the first one we do is we have elastic job guidelines. Now that's very different to the philosophy of a lot of other organisations who believe you have to have very narrowly defined job guidelines so that you can very clearly control and monitor the interactions between people. We believe that those interactions should be flexible. And so we have very elastic job guidelines. We don't even call them job definitions. We call them job guidelines. So that each person can, at the edges, at the margins of their job responsibility, they can move if they see an opportunity or if they see where they can contribute. Um, and we don't want the system to prevent them from doing that. Secondly, as we plan their career, we, just, we give them different complementary experience. And I'll give a bit of example of this in a short while. Uh, but we believe you should not go single-mindedly up the same uh, department for 15 years. If we can offer opportunities in different areas, we should do that because it allows different facets of people's personality and different management skills to emerge. Third, the way we organize our learning is designed to enable. Our learning is not designed to say you should do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's designed to say here's how you should think about yourself and how your personality and your management style should emerge from the activity you do. It's meant to be enabling rather necessarily than channeling. We encourage pushing people into stretch positions, making them go a bit beyond what they're capable of at a given moment in time, just to see when we stretch them like that what they're able to do, and the organization will support them in that stretch task. And all of our leaders have gone through that process. In their late 20s or early 30s, they've been given a job which is designed to be a stretch. I can just quote from my own example, at the age of 30, I was asked, I'm English, and I was asked to go and run a business in Holland at the age of 30, which was a big ask, uh, and I made some mistakes, but the organization helped me move into that position uh, and helped me overcome my mistakes and learn as a manager. And every single manager in L'Oreal can tell a story like that, where they've been exposed uh, in something that stretches them, and it's sometimes a little bit, um, you know, uneasy feeling, but we believe it enables the best part of people to then emerge. We have no single management style. People manage as their, as their personality and character uh, would, would dictate. Um, and we also believe that you achieve legitimacy 
by what you do, not simply because you have a title. If you have a title of finance director, that's fine, but it's how that finance director contributes to the business that his or her reputation will be established. And the third and final part of that philosophy about developing leaders is that we put a lot of store by personal characteristics. Um, uh, so again, we don't manufacture leaders. Leaders emerge because of their personal char characteristics. And some of those I've listed on the chart, it's about courage and risk-taking. It's about decisiveness and conviction. Leaders have to show conviction if they're going to bring a team to meet ambitious targets. It's about strong communication ability and the ability to mobilize other people around them. And it's about perseverance and tenacity because it's not an easy world. The beauty business is a very competitive world with very strong companies, with very strong retailers, with very demanding consumers. Um, and you have to have that perseverance and tenacity to make sure that your ideas and your ambitions are going to actually be realized in that environment. So it's what I say at the bottom. It's the spirit of an entrepreneur inside a large organization. So we know we're a large organization. We have to have a minimum number of structures and boundaries, but we try very hard to keep the spirit of entrepreneur alive and to enable people to feel that they can be an entrepreneur inside that organization, and that encourages leadership to emerge. Um, and uh, the example I would give for how we then put that into practice at the highest level is if you look at our board appointments, the average age of people being appointed to our board is 44 years old, and we're a 30 billion US dollar company. Um, so that stretch and that belief in people goes right through to the top of the company where we believe in promoting people, stretching them into those jobs, even at board level. So I thought it's only fair to then illustrate a few examples from what I've been saying. So here from Russia are some examples of people who have developed that leadership, who have demonstrated it, and who have emerged, but in quite different ways. If you take Sasha Emelianov, Emelianov um, he started out as a sales manager in the mid-90s, and as you can see from his CV, uh, by the time he turned 30, he was already a commercial director here in Russia, and then at the age of 31, he was made a commercial director outside Russia, in Slovenia. Uh, he became a general manager of the Vichy brand in his early 30s, um, and he's progressed through, he's now in Greece, running one of our divisions, um, so you can see the speed of promotion, because he demonstrated the ability and the appetite for us to want to continue stretching him, and so we did. So that's an example where he's now worked in four different countries um, very successfully. But equally, the example on the right is just as valid because you don't have to be international in L'Oreal. If you want to stay in your own country, you can equally develop uh, an aggressive career path. So uh, Alexandre Radeyev is head of one of our divisions, a position he's occupied now for some time, but again, you can see the speed at which he moved through the organization in his early career he was made a division manager well before the age of 40. Some younger profiles, uh, including one or two that come from this university. So Guzel Ishmatova is a recent graduate from St. Petersburg. And as you can see, uh, only four years after graduating, she's now working in France in our head office. Uh, Oksana has also taken a different path, and she's now working in London at our body shop branch. Uh, and equally, you can see the number of times that she has been promoted in a fairly short space of time has showed that we're delivering on this idea that we want to stretch people and give them the opportunity to demonstrate their own leadership capacity by giving them rapidly, ac rapid access to management opportunity. Uh, those were mainly examples from marketing, but we have examples from other uh, disciplines. Um, you can see here uh, somebody who's moved between sales and marketing, Alexander Kazantsev who's also a graduate from St. Petersburg. Uh, Yuri Samarodov uh, is stayed in the sales uh, discipline, but as you can see, at a very young age, he's already a regional sales director in one of our divisions here in Russia. And here's a couple of other examples, one from finance and another from marketing. Again, people who are less than 10 years from graduation, but have very quickly been given management exposure and management opportunity, sometimes in Russia, sometimes outside Russia. So here, for example, you have uh, Asiat, who was worked for some while in France before coming back here, um, and equally, the financial controller, who's now working in our office in Amsterdam, 
as a financial controller for one of the divisions. So a series of examples of, of Russian men and women who joined our company, who have been willing to live the adventure with us, and who, because, as I say, we have a very permissive form of leadership development to let leaders emerge, um, have been able to do that themselves and create their own story um, about, about their own adventure, almost, inside L'Oreal. Uh, you know, you are yourself a clear illustration of energy, passion, and fun. And uh, the way you cover all the questions are so much broader than only HR function. So I'm curious, what is your personal track inside L'Oreal and outside? How did you came to the present position? Maybe it could be a good example for all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you. Well, I, as you understood, I'm British. Uh, I joined L'Oreal in Britain when it was actually a very small business uh, 25 years ago, a long time ago. Um, and I joined in marketing, uh, and after a, a couple of marketing responsibilities, I got my first general manager appointment in Holland, as I explained, when I had a business unit to run in Holland. And that's where I picked up most of my commercial understanding through that job and, and P&L management. Uh, then I went and started a business for L'Oreal in India. At the time, we had very little business in, in Asia, and so I was the guy who launched the L'Oreal business in India. It took five years. And, I made some mistakes, going back to your question, you learn from your mistakes, but the end result after five years was actually a pretty strong business. Uh, I then ran the UK for about four years, and then the group asked me to move into human resources, and, and the group is very open to people changing disciplines as long as it makes sense for the individual and for the company. So um, I did that, and actually, I can give you a small scoop, because as of next month, I'm changing again, and I'm moving from human resources to run a region. For the, for the group, uh, a region around the world. Um, and, uh, but I think what's also maybe behind your question is my, the fact that I feel confident to field questions on anything to do with our company is also the fact that I think when you spend a bit of time inside that community, you understand the company beyond your own personal discipline. Um, if a finance person was standing up here, I suspect the finance person would feel comfortable about answering the same questions or a salesperson, because when you're part of a, of a team around a brand or an entity or even a country, you're working continuously with all these people and you're picking up on why they're making the decisions they're making, what are their difficulties, what are their opportunities, and you absorb all that and you become, yeah, you do become a bit of an evangelist for the whole country, for the whole company, it's true. And I'm one of those evangelists. But so is Jerome and so is Sebastian and so are many other people. Thank you. Um, any last question from the floor? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you, um, how did your education influence your career? Actually, how did it help you in L'Oreal? Um, that's a very, I did not do a business degree. I have to tell you, I'm afraid I did not do an MBA. Um, I studied politics and economics at Oxford. Um, I think what the education did is it firstly taught my mind how to analyze and how to reach my own convictions. That, that's what I think my university education it, it basically trained my mind or enabled my mind to know how to analyze something, how to choose between different interpretations of events, and then how to forge my own convictions. So that's, I think, what it did for me. As I say, I didn't have the benefit of, of an MBA, and I'm sure if I'd been given some of the, that business theory, I maybe would have made fewer mistakes than I did in my early career. But, but I think what, what uh, academic rigor teaches you, and particularly if it's enlightened, like, like your institution here, it's designed, I think, to expose you to a wide number of interpretations of events, know how to analyze them, know how to make your choices, and then forge your own convictions about what the right decision is or the right approach is in a given set of circumstances. I hope, Vice Rector, that doesn't go against anything that you uh, encourage inside the University of St. Petersburg. Uh, let me also use a chance to ask you a question. Uh, what are your expectations for the new generation of managers which is sitting in this room? In few years from now, they will probably come out and uh, battle the generations of managers and leaders who are now in the positions uh, in L'Oreal as well. So uh, it's not about only ambitions and enthusiasm, but what do you think they should be equipped with? to be very successful in this battle for leadership in such companies as L'Oreal in the years to come? 
Um, well, I, I mentioned in my presentations personal characteristics, and I think those will remain important um, for any generation and for any nationality. Um, I think that one of the advantages that, that your generation has is that you, are, you have no boundaries. Um, a combination of openness and, and the internet age and technology means that, that you can conceive of the world and of business opportunities in ways that my generation never could. Um, so you will still need the same, I think, academic rigor and business skills and personal characteristics to, to, to get ahead, but you will bring something that my generation didn't have and therefore you will take my place and you will take the place of, of my generation because I think you have this, this limitless idea of what is possible. Uh, you know how to access knowledge and opportunity from all sorts of different places uh, that we wouldn't have dreamt about doing. So, uh, and I know, I mean, people talk about, you know, the, the, uh, this generation and it has all its hallmarks. I personally think that the values of your generation are very in tune with the L'Oreal culture because our culture has always been an entrepreneurial culture. It's always been a culture about people to bring energy and to push the boundaries. And your generation is particularly well equipped, I think, to meet that, unlike, say, the generation of 15 years ago, which brought a different, maybe, set of characteristics to organizations. Um, but but I, I, I genuinely think that, that, that you are, what characterizes your generation is particularly well suited to go inside an organization like ours. And we haven't changed our organization to adapt to you. We've always been like that. But I just think it's a meeting of opportunity between a culture that has shown that it can work in different countries around the world and over the, over the generations. And you are bringing a particular set of skills and set of possibilities that I think is very in sync with L'Oreal. So I wish you all luck with it. Come and join us. <laughs>